uh, I actually uh, represent a couple of uh, organizations from the United States in Virginia. Uh, first one is Virginia IADS Consortium. IADS is Accelerator Driven Systems. And the second one is the International Symposium on Hydrogen and Matter, which is a nonprofit organization which is uh, started to understand the fundamental interaction of hydrogen with matter. And it runs a symposium and supports the young students to attend the symposium. To give you a brief history of uh, accelerator driven systems, this gives you the timeline. Uh, 1950, uh, Lawrence. Uh, suggested the use of high power accelerators for producing fissile materials. And in 1952, uh, Louis, I think he's from Canada, proposed the use of thorium with intense neutron generator. So it goes back to just about my birthday. <laughs> anyway, uh, Charlie Bauman proposed the ener energy generation with uh, accelerator transmutation of waste in 1992. And it was proposed by, it was followed by Carlo Rubia, a concept known as energy amplifier in 1993. Uh, basically, all this is to use thorium, which is a non proliferation, no meltdown, uh, which is safe and probably uh, least involvement in RC, hopefully. Uh, Charlie Bauman has uh, actually uh, calculated the neutron costs with respect to the ADS systems. And these were not implemented, or uh, there was a review done, I think, by DOE, something like in 2009. And it was felt that the accelerated driven system technology is not available readily to implement the ADS. And actually, DOE went back and reviewed this in something like 2010. Then there are uh, some recommendations from that, I believe. But anyway, according to this, uh, after the SNS, which is a spallation neutron source uh, built in uh, Oak Ridge, which uses a mercury target, you can see the cost has come down from the initial something like 10 to the power of 12 uh, dollars per gram to something like uh, 1 10 to the power of 6, which is a, a 10 to the power of 6 reduction in the cost. And if we can optimize these systems, the expected cost is somewhere between 1.5 to 2 10 to the power of 5 dollars per gram of neutrons. This is the Gemstar estimate. That's by Charlie Bowman. Gemstar means uh, a green energy multiplier subcritical transmutation, transmitting advanced reactor. That is the acronym for that. And this actually shows you the uh, scheme from Dr. Banerjee. Uh, he showed this at University of Virginia uh, colloquium in May 2010, and I believe this fits into their third stage program where only uranium 233 or thorium, with, along with thorium 233, are used together. Mainly, this also breeds, and in principle, you have the accelerator here putting that extra neutrons that are required for this process to go through. So, as I mentioned, uh, we have something called Virginia IDS Consortium Institutions to promote the use of accelerator driven systems for generating power. And the consortium members include, uh, uh, most of them are from Virginia, but they're also from outside the US. Casting Analysis is a corporation, and so is Muons Inc. Both are located in Virginia. Homi Baba National Institute is a deemed government of India University in India. Idaho State University, Jefferson Lab, where I'm actually employed, uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, University of Virginia, Virginia Commonwealth University, and Virginia Tech. Uh, we believe uh, in the big January of next year, Virginia General Assembly is expected to legislate uh, to put in an organization called Virginia Nuclear Energy Consortium, and this will be included into that consortium. So this ADS consortium has actually, uh, in collaboration with ISOHIM, organized a couple of international workshops. OK, this was organized by Virginia Tech in collaboration with Jefferson Lab and ISOHIM and a few others. And what you are seeing here is a conceptual uh, design of Jumpstar uh, on one of the mezzanines of near Los Alamos National Laboratory. 
what you see here is a accelerator and a reactor in principle. Uh, I believe the most of the technology designs are done. If anyone has deep pockets here, about $200 million, you can build this system within five years according to Charlie Bowman. So basically, if anyone has money, it can be built on that side in principle. That was one of the highlights of the first meeting we did. And the second meeting was organized by Baba Atomic Research Center in India, which was in, during December 11th to 14th, 2001. Uh, please feel to browse these uh, websites, and all the presentations are here. Uh, here you need to go if you want to see the presentations. Uh, I believe it's somewhere in the programs. Program, if you go there, you can actually see all the presentations there. So I mentioned earlier that DOE has uh, done another review in 2010, and these are the findings. Uh, ADS subcritical systems offer the potential for safely burning fuels, which are difficult to incorporate in critical systems. For example, fuel without uranium or thorium. Finding three, ADS subcritical system can be utilized to efficiently burn minor actinides. This is the main proposal from Charlie Bowman to exactly do that using GEMSTAR. And finding four, ADS subcritical systems can be utilized to generate power from thorium fuels. And this is what India is planning to do, as I have shown in that cartoon. This is regarding ADS technologies. Basically, this shows uh, the beam loss studies from SNS, uh, dating 2011, I think it's uh, September 25. Uh, basically, SNS uh, accelerates H minus ions. And you can see here, uh, the design values here, and this is actually the measurement. And in actually, in area systems, you would be accelerating protons. In that case, the beam loss is uh, really going to be very small compared to that one. And these are the calculations and measurements which agree very well uh, with this data from uh, SNS. And another issue is the number of faults that are, can be allowed in these systems, and that report shows for these systems to be implemented, uh, if it is a transmutation demo, these are the number of trips for this type of uh, time intervals allowed. Uh, if it is industrial scale ADS prototype or power plant, these are the requirements for the machine, ADS uh, accelerator driven system. But these are the SNS experiences with H minus ion. And as you know, SN is a one of a kind machine built with uh, not much of research done. It was built in a very short period of three to four years. So it is not optimized for this kind of operation. And we believe with carefully designed Linux, one would be able to uh, meet the requirements required for ADS systems. And as you probably know, that there is a first world's ADS project, which is known as Mira project in Belgium. Uh, what you are seeing is uh, that it requires an accelerator with the energy of 600 MeV uh, with 4 milliamp proton beam, which is about 2.4 megawatts of power required, that is CW. And here the reactor could be uh, either subcritical or critical. And the target is, uh, uh, I believe, uh, I am not sure which the target at this moment is, but the coolant is lead bismuth coolant. And they also have possibilities to do irradiation using the neutrons that are coming from this spallation source. Uh, it, they, they believe it's a very innovative and unique idea. So I think that's all overall I'm going to say about, in principle, the ADS. Uh, now I would like to focus on the uh, obtaining a very high efficient uh, Linux. And the basic structures of these are made out of solid niobium. And I will uh, explain what we are doing with that to achieve very low cost structures with uh, very high efficiency. This is very crucial, and I will try, try to explain that now. Uh, I think for most of these people here, uh, the terminology is required. You need to understand what I'm saying. Uh, the material used for this accelerator structure is uh, niobium, which is a highly ductile refractory metal with highest superconducting transition temperature of 9.25. And the purity of the material is defined, 
uh, defined by residual resistance ratio uh, R300 by R4.2, the important interstitials, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, they contribute mostly to the triple R, and there is substitutional impurity tantalum, which does not really affect triple R. So I want you to keep that in mind. And the performance of this accelerator structures is, uh, it depends on the surface resistance of the niobium material. Uh, at the operating temperature is 2.2K, basically. Uh, it consists of the RBCS and residual resistance and the uh, resistance due to dislocations. Uh, the RBCS depends on the surface magnetic field, electron mean free power, temperature, and frequency. Uh, the quality factor, as I mentioned, of the cavities depends uh, on the geometric ratio and the surface resistance, where the geometry ratio of the cavities that are used in these accelerators is, the, is independent of the cavity frequency, and ideally it could be something like 2 to 10 to the power of 11 at 2K. The surface magnetic field is the one which is uh, limiting the performance of these cavities and also the accelerating gradient. These are related. And optimizes processes and procedures that I'll try to come to that later. Uh, and there is uh, something I uh, recently uh, call figure of merit of niobium, which is a product of Q0 and the uh, accelerating quench field. Sorry, this is a new, maybe new terminology for you. But anyway, these SRF cavities are made with uh, solid niobium. And at present, uh, the niobium comes from a columbite tantalite ore. And niobium is present in this ore as an impurity. Niobium is produced as a byproduct of tantalum. The primary reasons for using the columbite tantalite ore instead of the other work known as pyrochlor, which I will explain a little later, is that the tantalum content is lower in this ore because it's a byproduct, so you can actually spec whatever you want in that. And current spec specifications for the tantalum content is less than 500 weight ppm. So it is generally believed to negatively impact the SRF properties of niobium. And so uh, the data from Jefferson Lab shows that reducing tantalum content below 1,000 ppm has no advantage for the superconducting RF cavities. Whereas the low tantalum niobium is relatively expensive. So if you want to cut down the cost of these things, one has to relax the spec. That's all I'm trying to say here. And uh, this is the production processes used uh, in producing niobium. This is the tantalum columbite ore. You basically get niobium pentoxide, niobium powder. Uh, this is another type of ore known as a pyrochlor. And you basically get the niobium also from this side. And the final steps are done by a vendor here which is to get the niobium sheets or rods or n guards. Uh, this is basically separation, it's not that important. This is a niobium production for, from pyrochlor ore. Uh, this is the process here, and basically you get the, after aluminothermic reduction, you get the E-beam defined niobium n guards, which are taken by the vendor to produce niobium sheets. Whereas, you can actually use the ingot niobium that's coming directly from the, uh, this production, which may be less expensive, but the only problem is the tantalum content may be higher than the specs that are currently proposed or used. So this is the largest pyrochlor niobium ore in the world, uh, and they have a production capacity of 210 tons per annum currently for the finished ingot, pure ingot niobium, and they are planning to double this. Uh, as I said, the original uh, current practices are to use the fine grain niobium sheet so that you can form the cavity half cells. And this is the process used for that. And during this process, it is possible to have inclusions of foreign materials in the steps of this rolling or any of these steps. So QA is required. As a result, the cost of this niobium is pretty high. So in 2004, uh, the CBMM uh, and JLab started collaborating to understand the specification requirements for this uh, tantalum, why it should be so low. During that process, we reinvented what we call as ingot niobium technology. And using, that is the ingot niobium is sliced into uh, sheets 
and they are formed into cavities. And once, uh, with that process, the cost could be very much reduced, and the performance also pretty high. This is the accelerating gradient here and the quality factor. You want this to be very high. So this shows you the comparison of different materials with the triple R's ranging from 150 to 450 from three different vendors. Uh, basically, the performance of the niobium single cell cavities, they are identical. But the cost difference of the material is uh, potentially a factor of three, what you use from the vendors here. So if you go to the ingot niobium route, basically what you are, you are eliminating most of the steps, you basically take the ingot that is uh, coming from here and you slice this and you can use it. As a result, you can save a lot uh, of you know, cost on this one, and also the efficiency of these structures is much higher. We, have, we defined something called figure of merit, which is a product of the quality factor at the, the gradient which, where it thermally breaks down. And this gives you the, for a large grain ingot niobium, uh, basically with a, triple, uh, with a tantalum content up to 800, there is not really much difference. Whereas, in a polycrystalline niobium, depending on the, you take the low tantalum content niobium, basically the quality effect, uh, the figure of merit is not uh, as high compared to the tantalum content uh, about, I think here is about 1375. Uh, we also have done some studies how uniformly this tantalum is distributed in this uh, cube, six cube surface of this niobium. We found that it is very uniformly distributed. So there is no issue of this uh, having uh, precipitates anywhere to give a bad performance. There are contamination on the surface of these cavities determines the performance of uh, these cavities. And these can be divided into two groups, extrinsic and intrinsic. This is mainly surface contamination. And we now understand the uh, reasons for all of this. And we are able to successfully eliminate this. And we still have some issues with intrinsic to get to very high quality factors. And the most important one is the hydrogen, uh, absorption of hydrogen during the processing steps of these niobium cavities. And also, the dislocations that develop due to the forming of these cavities and all that also affects the uh, surface resistance. Uh, as I said, the hydrogen plays a major role in this. Uh, I'll skip this. And there are two uh, processes that are used different kinds. One is a buffer chemical polish to clean the, to remove the damage layer. And the second one is electro polish. Depending on which one you use and depending on the type of niobium you use, uh, you have different amounts of hydrogen uh, contamination on the surface that will determine uh, the performance. Uh, what happens is, as soon as you do the process cleaning of this, and within a few seconds, a niobium pentoxide forms on the cavity surfaces. And that actually minimizes the uh, introduction of hydrogen into niobium. But during these processes, basically, we remove the pentoxide. Uh, and as a result, actually, water comes in contact with niobium, and hydrogen goes in. So lower fugacity of hydrogen in the electro polishing actually minimizes the absorption of hydrogen in electro polishing. Uh, this is the main difference between these two processes. And the final step done is uh, to remove this hydrogen. One goes and degasses these cavities in the ovens at around 8 to 900 degrees centigrade for about three to six hours. And since these furnaces are not very clean, uh, you get surface contamination. As a result, you have to go back and do the chemistry on that to remove the surface. During this process, again, hydrogen goes back in. As a result, there is a problem associated with this. And if you analyze the samples that have come out of the furnace without, I mean, it, this is heat treated sample. This is the SIMS data, which so, shows you the hydrogen concentrations. Uh, here you can see NB, NBH, H1, H2, H3, H5. Whereas in the heat treated case, you are removing a lot of hydrogen. You are only left with NB and NBH and NBH2. So this actually plays an important role in uh, the quality effect of these cavities. So recently, we built a clean UHE furnace where we can do the final process steps uh, in a clean way where you don't have any surface contamination and one doesn't need to re-etch these cavities. As a result, 
uh, you can eliminate the final chemistry of these uh, cavities. So what you see here is uh, with this new furnace, new process of uh, high temperature heat treatment, we were able to get very high quality factors, something like 5, 10 to the power of 10 at gradients, somewhere up to 20, 25, which are required for the accelerator driven systems in CW mode. And the advantage of, another advantage of uh, ingot niobium material is that you have something called a phonon peak at 2K, where these accelerator cavities are operating. And even if you have some heat dissipation uh, from uh, surface impurities, due to this phonon, phonon peak, you are able to I mean, remove that heat very effectively, which is not possible with fine grain niobium cavities, because you don't have the phonon peak and the thermal conductivity of fine grain cavities will go down uh, somewhere here. So there is a, at least a factor of two to three higher thermal conductivity within gut niobium. We also found that the mechanical properties of in gut niobium improve with these high temperature treatments, which is not the case with fine grain. They actually they degrade with heat treatment because of micro yielding due to the growth of the grains. So what we have done so far is we have demonstrated that high triplar niobium is not required for these accelerated structures, uh, which will cut down the cost. Uh, the tantalum up to 1300 weight ppm is fine. It doesn't uh, drastically affect the performance. So one could go and use the niobium coming from this largest pyroclear mine, uh, where the cost is going to be uh, a factor of three difference. And in gut niobium technology is actually demonstrated uh, by uh, DAISY in Germany with conventional processes. And recently, we have implemented simplified processes, and we are able to achieve a factor of four improvement in quality factor. That means the heat loss into the accelerator system will be reduced by that amount. And also, the, you need a refrigerator. Part of the major cost of the system is a 2K refrigeration system. So you do not need that much of refrigeration capacity, so the plant cost will come down, as well as the operating cost will come down. So the future outlook of this technology uh, is it is very good for CW SRF applications. We expect that this technology will be the preferred choice for future superconducting CW Linux worldwide. And I believe uh, AD, the Mira project would benefit. They are considering to use this technology, and we are trying to develop some collaboration on that. Several labs from around the world, uh, from three continents, are discussing joint program to optimize the ingot niobium multicell cavity processes for high efficiency and high intensity CW Linux applications. So finally, uh, this is the ISO HIM nonprofit organization. There are some publications we have put together. And uh, the ingot niobium technology I just explained uh, are covered in these two uh, proceedings of AAPCP 927 and AAPCP 1352. So that's where the technology currently is. I believe the ADS systems will uh, benefit from this technology drastically. And that is the reason why we started this consortium, Virginia ADS Consortium, to promote this technology for our generation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. The problem often with superconductors is that if you make them too pure, the flux line lattice becomes rather mobile. Um, and that can lead to problems in, in superconducting RF cavities. You seem to be trying to get to a very high level of purity with your niobium. Is that necessarily the best way forward? Or may you be better uh, doping the niobium to try and pin the superconducting flux line? Actually, I became a paria because I proposed using low triplar niobium for this particular application. Mainly, the BCS losses will come down if you dope the material with impurities, uh, because the mean free pop of the normal electrons will come down with impurities. This is very important. What happened was, uh, the last 40 years, the technology went in the wrong route. And I'm trying to correct it as I become, for the last uh, 15 years, I am doing this battle all by myself with some collaborations. Now, finally, it has come into the fruition. And I think people are slowly accepting this. And uh, 
uh, there will be some discussion next week at JLab. There's a Tesla technology collaboration. Uh, for the first time, I have been asked to uh, explain uh, what are the advantages of this technology, both from the cost point of view and performance point of view. So actually, I'll be dividing the subjects into the types of niobium, that is pyrochlor-based or uh, other uh, columbite and tantalum. That actually, uh, this is mainly important for the cost point of view. Then, is it high pure or low pure, or is ingot niobium or fine grain? And then the process steps. The process steps involved currently are very complex chemistry, and there's something called barrel polishing that can be done without any acids. And since we have now this new clean furnaces, you don't need to do chemistry. You can do the, the, the cleaning with barrel polishing, which gives you smooth surface, and go and uh, anneal these cavities at 14 or 1600 degrees with ingot niobium in these new furnaces that we are developing. Then you will have very high Q at a very low cost, and as a result, you will have much better accelerator systems at a lower cost, both for running as well as construction. And it has, I mean, I have been thrown out for the last uh, 17 years or so, so slowly I am getting back into the loop. That's why I have to start all this. I saw him as mainly for me to do this kind of activities with outside people without being controlled. I won't be here otherwise.